Uh, yeah, so as Carl was mentioning, we did uh, environmental site assessment of the property. I'm just going to walk through the results of that. So I'm going to start by just talking about what was done. So there's two phases to the study, a phase one and a phase two. Um, how we did the studies, what were the results, and what the next steps are going to be. So the purpose of the phase one environmental site assessment is basically to identify possible sources of contamination that might be present on the site. So we do that by looking at uh, historical land use, um, you know, how the land is being used now, uh, consulting historical records that might be available, looking at aerial photos from, you know, as far back as we can get, uh, looking at the neighboring properties, and also visual inspection of the site. And from that basically is generated what we call an apex or area, areas of potential environmental concern. So, you know, you identify your areas of potential environmental concern and then determine if uh, it's necessary to do a phase two environmental site assessment. So then the phase two environmental site assessment, you're basically taking all those areas, developing a plan to sample them. Um, so you know, we want to determine whether those potential concerns are actually something that we need to be worried about. And you do that by sampling um, strategically soil, surface water, groundwater, and sediment across the site. Um, so this, these two phases were done. Uh, the phase one was started in uh, the early winter, uh, January, February 2017. Uh, the phase two began field work in the fall of 2017. Uh, in spring of 2018, the phase two was completed. Um, and then you know, there was an analysis of all the results that were gathered. And finally, we're presenting these results to you here. So through the phase one, um, 27 areas of potential environmental concern across the course were identified. Um, these relate to a number of different uh, areas. There's the historic use of pesticides. You know, the course has been in operation for more than 100 years, and certainly pesticides uh, that were used um, quite a long time ago are, are quite different than the ones that are used today. So they often had heavy metals in them. So that's definitely a possible concern. Um, there was fill placed in various places of unknown origin. So to fill in uh, low spots in the course or for roads across the site. Uh, there were a number of above ground storage tanks. And these were basically uh, mostly used for heating. So oil tanks for heating uh, the caretaker's uh, house or the clubhouse. Uh, there had been a fire. Um, one of the buildings had burned down in the 70s or, or early 80s. So that was identified as a possible area of concern. Um, at the back of the course, there had been a location where they had been storing yard waste for a number of years. And you may recall a few years ago, uh, a cleanup of that area was undertaken because, you know, it had become more than just yard waste. There was quite a bit of garbage and, and stuff in there as well. So uh, there's still some concern possible with that location. Uh, some septic discharges. So there's septic tanks uh, associated with the clubhouse on the site. So testing some of the uh, surface water for any signs of potential leakage from those tanks. And then neighboring properties as well. Um, the property was surrounded by railways quite a long time ago. Uh, there's the adjacent golf course. Um, there's an auto garage not too far away. And then septic discharge from surrounding residential houses as well. So these are all summarized here. And all the maps that uh, are in the presentation are, are going to be hard to see. So we have large versions of all the maps on the tables in the center here. So you can certainly have a look at those afterwards, but just basically summarizing all the different areas of potential environmental concern. Most of them are quite localized. They're associated with a building or a tank. Some of them are more widespread, like the pesticide use across you know, all the greens and fairways. So a sampling program was designed based on those uh, potential concerns and targeted these uh, various areas. So 12 test pits. 
were dug on the site and soil samples were collected in those test pits. Um, 17 boreholes were drilled around the site uh, and then that included the installation of seven monitoring wells. So those are still there now. Uh, 17 soil samples were taken in those uh, cores and then seven water samples were also taken from the groundwater wells. We had 18 surface soil samples and those were again associated with the um, greens, tea boxes and fairways. We undertook sediment sampling in some of the creeks around the course, eight samples there. And these were all analyzed for various parameters based on what the concern, potential concern was. These included um, PAHs, which are poly uh, aromatic hydrocarbons. So basically these are found uh, byproducts of uh, incomplete uh, burning of fuels and also present in asphalts and other sort of hydrocarbons. And then petroleum hydrocarbons, which would be more indicative of a spill of oil or gas. Um, PCBs which, uh, are found, you know, in old transformers and that which could potentially be on the site. Uh, but the pesticides were sampled, we sampled the E. coli, and that's an indicator of fecal contamination. So that would be from a faulty septic system. Uh, volatile organic carbons, again a byproduct of uh, incomplete combustion. Uh, and then metals, which uh, uh, again could be present in the pesticides or in various other compounds. So uh, test pitting, another uh, thing that came up during the phase two was the potential, uh, we had been tipped off that there potentially been some uh, barrels that had been buried in a specific location on the site. So we identified the location of those, um, you know, to the best of the recollection, you know, this was 30 or, or 50 years ago even that uh, these were buried at the location and we undertook full test pitting in that area, basically excavating the whole area to try to see if we could find uh, evidence of these buried uh, drums. So again, this is just a, a map that's available on the side here showing all the different uh, sampling locations across the site. And just a few visuals of a uh, test pit. So basically just excavating a hole. So you're sampling uh, in the soil a little bit lower down, you know, where fuels might seep into the ground. Uh, just an example of the borehole driller. So. There's a hand auger that was used for some of the shallower or smaller holes and then for a drill mounted rig was used to install the monitoring wells on the site. Um, one of the surface water sampling locations and then the surface sampling was just uh, digging a very shallow hole on the greens. And then again, the um, search for the barrels was basically a complete excavation. So we did 11 rows throughout the area that was suspected to have those barrels uh, buried and went right down to native soil. So once all these samples were collected, uh, they were compared to a number of different regulatory standards. Um, those available in Ganawagi. Uh, Canadian standards as well as Quebec standards. And the standards consider various different thresholds. So uh, be it human health, impacts to aquatic organisms, or drinking water standards. And so when we get into some of the exceedances that were found, you know, it's important to remember um, all the different things that were compared to, right? So just to give an example, uh, in some of the um, groundwater, you know, we took samples and there were exceedances of, say, iron from a drinking water perspective, but that's not necessarily a concern in this case because nobody's drinking that water um, that's just getting pulled out of the ground. So just keep that in mind when we go through some of the uh, exceedances. But uh, So just moving on to the results. Um, numerous samples did have parameters that exceeded uh, the regulatory standards. 
And so some of these were associated with localized issues and others were more widespread across the, across the whole course. And I'm just gonna go through you know, each of the main uh, areas of exceedance and you know, what the proposed next steps are to deal with those. So the first one was uh, quite a high exceedance of hydrocarbons uh, identified northeast of the maintenance garage and that was associated with a pile of uh, disturbed soil of unknown origin that was identified in one of the aerial photographs uh, through the phase one environmental site assessment. Um, so this was raised with uh, the golf club and they have actually agreed to remove the soil uh, so that basically dealing with this issue entirely at this point. And they've actually had a crew in the field uh, removing and testing that soil uh, in the previous days, and that's going to continue next week as well. And just uh, what I had mentioned there, this is the aerial photo from uh, 1990, I believe, and you can see there's some disturbance in that area. So that was how that area was flagged as a possible concern. Uh, and then just visually, again, this map is located on the side, but this was the area in question here. And the red basically being an exceedance of uh, Quebec's uh, highest threshold standard, meaning that the soil needs to be removed and treated not at a, a specific facility. So uh, the next uh, issue that was identified was with uh, the septic system at the maintenance garage. Uh, so a high E. coli reading, which again is just a bacteria that's found, uh, it's basically an indicator bacteria demonstrating that there's fecal contamination. So a very high reading was found in a creek uh, downstream from the maintenance garage. Um, you know, obviously this is a concern because it's an indicator that their septic system isn't working properly. And again, this was raised with the golf club and they've uh, agreed to have the um, septic systems on the course inspected and to make any necessary repairs uh, to meet current standards for septic uh, treatment. And E. coli is basically something that uh, will persist in the environment for a you know, maximum of six months. So once this issue is resolved, you know, once the septic system is repaired, we don't anticipate any long-term uh, impacts associated with it. And there's just the location of the sample that uh, revealed that exceedance. Uh, along the southwest property boundary of the course, um, there were some groundwater samples that were taken. And they revealed the presence of some PAHs. So again, just the incomplete breakdown of uh, hydrocarbons. Um, so this was uh, sort of interesting because it was in the groundwater, which you know was indicative that it might not be coming from the course, but might be related to um, something off-site. And it was in the area that had uh, railroads back in the uh, sort of early 1900s and, and earlier. So there was a railroad that sort of went all around the course, and you know we think that might be the cause of. Uh, of that exceedance, but we can't tell for sure at this point. So the proposal is to undertake a bit more sampling to try to really understand why that exceedance has occurred and, and uh, what's causing it. Um, we don't believe there's any concern for drinking water in the area, for people that are on wells uh, in the neighboring area. Um, but if there is, you know, any, anything would uh, show up basically in the regular monitoring that is undertaken by environmental health services. So, you know, anybody on well water gets uh, their water tested regularly by environmental health services or they offer that program. So uh, we would just encourage people to participate in that program and, and uh, that should deal with this concern for now. And like I say, we'll be doing some additional testing to see if we can figure out exactly why that uh, exceedance has occurred. And again, just uh, along the southwest property boundary there in the highlighted area. Um, so then uh, you know, one uh, fairly significant finding was the uh, 
uh, elevated levels of metals, including uh, primarily mercury, but also some readings of chromium, cadmium, lead, and arsenic detected in the majority of the samples that were taken uh, in the surface soils, so on the greens, tea boxes, and fairways. Uh, you know, and this really points to a historic use of pesticides that often had heavy metals in them, just as uh, um, one of the elements that, I guess, helped keep the, keep the pesticide on the site. So these are persistent chemicals, uh, and metals obviously are persistent and will stay stay in the soil uh, basically indefinitely unless they're, they're physically removed. So uh, this is a, a concern. Um, we don't expect there to be any immediate health impacts based on the, the levels of the uh, metals that we're finding, but it's definitely something that we uh, want to take further action on. And some of the proposed actions include uh, sampling off-site locations, so occasionally, you know, you, you naturally, there are naturally occurring elements in the environment. Uh, mercury is one of them. So occasionally, um, just by chance, there's an area that has relatively high mercury levels compared to uh, various standards. So we just want to test some natural areas um, nearby the course to make sure that that's not what's happening here. So just excluding a possible natural occurrence of mercury in the area. Uh, we also want to sample for mercury um, at depth, so just going a little bit deeper than the surface soils to see whether they've sort of permeated into the ground at all or, um, you know, moved off of the greens and fairways or if they've just really stayed in that very shallow surface area. So just to gain a, a bit of a more perspective on the extent of the problem. And then we also want to undertake a, a targeted environment and human health uh, risk assessment. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So just to get an idea, you know, we took 18 samples and you can see quite a few of them um, were in exceeding, exceeding Ganawagi standards for um, mercury and other metals in the soil. So risk assessment. Basically, um, so there's standards that are set, and I mentioned the, the standards that we are comparing all our results to, and those standards are set based on basically a general scenario. So, you know, it's almost like flagging an issue for more consideration. So in this case, um, basically what we want to do is a targeted risk assessment. So that's going to look at you know, what those elevated readings mean here in this specific scenario. So we're looking at, you know, are there any health concerns now at, with the course being in operation? And we also want to look at if there's going to be any health concerns if down the road the golf course leaves and then, it, you know, it may become residential property. You know, what are the Im implications of that for these metals being in the soil? Um, and so a risk assessment basically looks at, at all the elements of risk. So you basically need three things to be present for uh, something to pose a risk to the community. Um, so the, you need the substance present, right? So in this case, we have some mercury present. You need an exposure pathway. So how does that mercury get from the soil to you know, a human uh, so it gets into their, their body, basically? The third is the receptor, so who is actually getting exposed to it? I'm just going to go through those three different elements a little bit. So the substance, you know, you have to consider the type of contaminant, um, the concentration, the distribution, and uh, also the release. So basically, uh, metals can, can sometimes just be very inert, so they're, you know, in this one form in the soil, and they don't really become available to be absorbed or taken up by, by humans or other organisms. So you know, we're going to do some testing to ter determine how available the mercury is. Um, the pathway. So this is how the contaminant can get to people or uh, other wildlife in the environment. So some examples of how this happens are through inhalation, just breathing it in. 
uh, ingestion, so whether you're eating it or you know, it's getting in your body through that way or just through the skin. And then we, you know, the risk assessment will also look at are there measures that can be taken to prevent these exposure pathways from occurring. So you know, an example of that is if you have some soil that's got some mercury in it, can you just put a cap on it so that you know, there's no way of physically contacting that material. Um, the third is receptors. So for risk assessment, um, receptors are often you're looking at the most sensitive individual. So in the case of a human health assessment, you would typically have a toddler would be considered the most at risk because they're often playing outside, you know, they're eating the dirt, they're, they're small, so you know, relative quantity versus their body mass uh, can be more impactful. Um, so in residential areas, you consider a toddler. For a commercial industrial location, you, you may look at uh, a pregnant employee or something like that. Um, for an environmental risk assessment for, with soil, you, you often look at organisms that are living in the soil and the impacts that might be, that might be having on them. So for example, earthworms uh, is an example of receptor for a environmental risk assessment. Um, so basically that's the, the study that we're looking to undertake next, uh, just to get a better understanding. As I say, we don't believe there's any immediate risk um, based on the levels that we're finding, but we want to make sure that, you know, certainly when the course reverts back to uh, potential residential use or, or whatever, we want to make sure there's not some, you know, long-term impact of that. Uh, so that uh, study is being funded by um, Canada, and we're currently moving forward uh, with it uh, with the same consultant that uh, worked on these, these uh, studies. Um, so there were other areas of potential environmental concern that were sampled for, and we did not find any other uh, exceedances that were, were of concern. So some of the areas that were potential concerns were able to be eliminated uh, from further consideration. And the test pitting operation that was undertaken didn't uh, um, find any barrels or any evidence of barrels. So, uh, you know, at this point we have to conclude that they're either were in a different location or have deteriorated to a point where, um, you know, they couldn't be found basically. So again, this is the timeline. Uh, the risk assessment has been funded, and we're going to be undertaking that work um, this winter, uh, hoping to get a few samples done before the snow flies, uh, but anything uh, else might uh, need to be done again, again in the spring if need be. And the Kanawaki Golf Club will fix those two immediate issues, that being the high hydrocarbon in that one area and uh, fixing up their septic system, um, you know, that's ongoing. So again, just mentioning that the maps are available here to uh, have a better look at the work that was done and it will certainly be uh, available for questions.